Olasky, and welcome to the Rabbi Olasky Show. And whether you're watching with our friends over at Torah Anytime, who are right now in the middle of a fundraising campaign, and I urge everyone who can to participate, and uh, wherever you watch or listen to your podcast, as always, we are so happy to have you along for the experience. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And we have another corporate sponsor. Finally, everybody woke up. You should know I got a couple of emails after our last uh, insurance uh, um, agency. Uh, and people said, well, I didn't know that you could make corporate sponsorships sound like fun. That's right. And uh, it'll be even more fun if you go and use their services. And today, we have another corporate sponsor for this episode, Sniper Studios. If you plan on killing anybody and you want it filmed, <laughs> just kidding, I'm kidding. Sniper Studios is the premier destination for full-scale production services. Now, you may be asking yourself, do I need full-scale production services? I'm glad you asked. Whether it's for your school play or camp performance, we've got you covered with top-of-the-line sound systems. You know how you know, sometimes they have one of these uh, things in, in school or camp and someone's like filming it on there? you know, uh, on their phone and it comes out looking like a Hamas video. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for a production that you can be able to give to people with pride. Yeah. We give you top of the line sound systems, wireless microphones, which comes in handy because if you're trying to act on stage, you know, with those cords as you're running around, that's problematic. Right? I remember I bought myself an electric car, but the extension cord is a killer. You know what I mean? So uh, wireless microphones and headsets, custom computerized theater lighting. That is so cool. And regal drapery to adorn your stage. You don't realize how much these things uh, make a difference in making your production um, uh, ordinaire and moving it to a level of exceptionality. Our comprehensive packages or for staging, scenery, professional video, shooting, editing, backstage communication systems, and screens and projection solutions. Wow. I mean, you're, you're in for a treat. Contact us at SniperStudioInc at gmail.com and experience perfection of the first shot with Sniper Studios. Uh, anyone who needs this, I'm encouraging you to go and look into it. And, uh, and that brings us to a very special episode, you know. Um, we try to be cutting edge here on the Robert Olafsky Show, as you no doubt know if you watch this. I am not one to move away from controversy. I'm not one to move away from current events. I'm not one to say outrageous things that have uh, turned out later to be false. <laughs> but there's been something in the news that's been going on that you really would have to work hard to miss. And this is the outrageous uh, demonstrations, encampments, um, uh, protests, they can call them whatever they want, uh, uh, Nuremberg-style Nazi rallies that are taking place on our universities. And uh, as always, when there's something that I know I'm not, qualified to speak about, like, let's say, Svarty Zmiros. So I bring in somebody who's a little bit more knowledgeable in the field. And when I saw this, I said to myself, I would like to tap one of the most talented resources that are out there. David Oleska has been fighting anti-Semitism on campus for well over 30 years. I don't know how much, I know, 30 years, I know for sure. It's got to be, well, 35 years ago, I heard you, so it had to be at least 40 years, yeah, on campus. And uh, I thought, let's bring him in and talk about what the problem is on campuses and how things have become so out of control today. So, David Olaska, welcome to the Rabbi Olaski Show. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to have you. And I guess I'm going to... Before we begin, address uh, the obvious elephant in the room, and I know it's a little embarrassing uh, to talk about, but I feel like we just have to get it out there. You're English. I'm in recovery. <laughs> and, and I happen to know for a fact that you're not even embarrassed by it. <laughs> I know this because I read an article that you wrote attacking Americans for getting braces. <laughs> 
And it's so interesting when they made um, uh, this movie, Austin Powers, which was supposed to be a takeoff on James Bond. So he was supposed to be English and they gave him these terrible teeth. <laughs> So I immediately thought of you. So uh, oh, thank, anyway. you. thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Not, not because of your teeth, but because of your outrage. <laughs> <laughs> this American concept of having straight teeth. And that's why no matter how much pressure I have received, I refuse to fill the gap in my teeth. I should <laughs> I think not. If this. David Letterman can have him, I certainly can. <laughs> having some fun now. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so... Let's get a little background. You're English. How did you get into this? You were doing this in, in England, English campuses as well? 40 years ago, uh, right. more than 40 years ago, it was worse on British campuses than it is here now. No um, way. Uh, yeah. Um, they were banning Jewish student clubs from campuses. Based on what? Uh, based on the idea that you know, at that time there was a neo-Nazi party in Britain called the National Front that was running right. in elections. Um, and many well-meaning student governments adopted a policy of no platform for racists and fascists. So they wouldn't allow the National Front to uh, operate on their campuses or to have events. And then the UN passed a resolution saying Zionism is racism. So they started banning Jewish student clubs on the ground that they supported Israel, and therefore they were racist organizations. And Why Way Rubenstein was the chaplain in Manchester? He, this was even before he was in Manchester, when he was still in Glasgow. And uh, he has astonishing stories to tell about this. And I think one interesting one is, you know, it really shows a, sheds a light on What's happening now on campuses here as well? He was, uh, I, I was there as well in Glasgow at a uh, an event where someone was speaking about the tragedy of Palestine. But this was in the days when the speaker would be a speaker from the Arab League, and this guy turns up, yeah, you know, wearing a, a suit that would cost more than the national domestic product of several small third world countries, you <laughs> know. <laughs> and uh, he speaks movingly about the uh, the tragedy of Palestine, and it goes to Q and A. And this non Jewish student, very obviously non Jewish student, stands up in the audience and gets the first question, and he says, in a very broad Glaswegian accent, which I'll moderate so, so you don't need subtitles. He says, "Yeah, I've got a question." Don't he talk to me about human rights? You're from Saudi Arabia, and in your country, you kind of get a bloody drink. And in front of a Scottish audience, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> this was an absolute clincher argument. Uh, but I think it, it... What did he say? The guy had nothing to answer. I had nothing to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it, it demonstrates something that's true today as well, that there's a vast gap between the way even the average student thinks and the self-proclaimed uh, defenders of Palestine are thinking. Um, and... Yeah, I, I, I've spent many years traveling around university campuses in North America and Europe and uh, other places as well. Um, and uh, Berkeley, right? Berkeley, California, the place if it was any more left wing would be in the Pacific. <laughs> um, I, 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 the first time I went there, um, they, I, I asked the students there on the spot, you know, what's it like? Is it very left wing here? And they said, yes, in certain departments. But you go to the engineering department or you go to the, you know, the economics department and people completely ignore all the shtick. They're only interested in getting on with their, uh, with their degrees and all the avarice that students are interested in doing when they're on campus. That's right. But in order to counter this, I mean, it's overwhelming. It's everybody. Like you, they were blocking Jewish students from going to class. They were, there were professors who were separating the Jews in class. You know, things were outrageous. Now, I know you have one method that I saw the first time I saw you, which blew me away. Uh, you got up there without a yarmulke and you introduced yourself as Dr. Philip Brooks Khalidi. <laughs> <laughs> and you presented yourself as a Palestinian whose family had fled uh, Palestine during the... 1967, was it? Yeah, and came to England. 
and you grew up in England, and you gave a, the Arab presentation to a group of students. It was an Orsamea, and they were they were ready to kill you. They were so angry, and the the most frustrating part was that they couldn't respond to anything you were saying. In other words, they didn't know how to answer anything. And you were presenting this, and then when they were really at, on, on a razor's edge, you put on your yarmulke and you said, I'm really David Alesco, let's take a five-minute break. <laughs> and then you came back and took apart all of the things that you said, which I cannot repeat. Right. But I just remember there are techniques that, uh, for example, I remember during the Lebanon War in 82, I was at the YU seminar, and I was supposed to be speaking about the situation in the Lebanon War in Israel. So I said, how are we, as the Jewish community, going to punish Israel for what they're doing in Lebanon? So these kids were kind of surprised. I, I was taking a leaf out of your book. And, uh, and they said, uh, well, the PLO wants to destroy Israel. I said, who said? He said, it's in their charter. So I pulled out a copy of the PLO Charter and I said, show me where. Who could find it? <laughs> it's like this big, long thing with all this kind of stuff. And uh, I don't know if you've ever saw, there was a video from the Babylon Bee where they were interviewing a Hamas guy. And he says, so I know this is a complicated issue and there's two sides, you know, what is it that you're really looking for? He goes, to kill all of the Jews. So he says, no, 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 uh, I understand that you're oppressed and therefore because of your territorial demands, no, no, we just want to kill all of the Jews, every Jew. <laughs> he says, no, no, of course you don't mean that. It's because, I, no, no, here, it's in my charter. Here, I'll, I'll send it to you. <laughs> it's right, right here, kill all the Jews. <laughs> And everyone, and this guy is like trying to get around and he's like, no, no, no. He says, but uh, what are your other aspirations? Because we want to deal with the uh, gay and lesbian population. He goes, oh, we want to bring them to Gaza and push them off of buildings. <laughs> yeah, look, it's right in my chart. <laughs> so, uh, so the anti-intellectualism of this, this mob mentality, I don't. I, I don't even know how you counter it. You can't. The, the, you you can't reason with people who, you know, block traffic, who stand outside of Jerry Seinfeld shows and shout him down, who go and attack all of these people. I I, I don't. Where do you start? It's it's so much. Which, since you've been in this business so long, I still remember when. Uh, universities in the 1950s were places where you went and you went to class, <laughs> you did your homework, you took tests, you wrote reports, right? Then in the 1960s, there was this youth rebellion. There were sit-ins, there were protests. Why didn't the schools just throw everybody out? Just say, okay, you've got one hour to disperse or we're going to run around with cameras and everyone who's out here is going to be expelled from the school. So that, and that would have ended it. Uh, well, it, it wouldn't have done. Because the 60s Youth Rebellion, especially in the United States, was centered around the Vietnam War. Right. Um, Bob Hope, who used to uh, entertain troops, he, I once saw him interviewed, he said he had a shtick that he did. He would go into a hospital ward full of wounded Vietnam uh, soldiers. And he said to him, guys, I'm here to tell you, America is 40% behind you. Uh, so... <laughs> So I, I, he might have been uh, overestimating it or underestimating it, but it was certainly a war that was not widely popular, not entirely popular. Right. Um, and so that issue, the issue that really made, within living memory, student activity a big deal, um, was something that people didn't feel entirely justified in crushing. But, but you're running a university. You know, I can't have a university if people are taking over the offices, aren't going to class. You know, I, I, I just can't run a university this way. So you want to go protest, go off and protest on your own time, make all the protests you want. But you have an obligation to go to class and let the university function. And somehow they just gave in to the students, which I don't understand. Well, it's not a new phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of the other hats that I wear is I'm, I'm a guide at Yad Vashem. And uh, last week, I guided a group of American students uh, who were here with Orson Mayer, 
guided them around Yad Vashem. And one of the first things you see inside the museum is an exhibit on the book burnings that happened on German university campuses. And people, you know, quite n naturally assume that it was imposed by the Nazi government. It wasn't. It was organized by the student governments, the elected student governments of the campuses. The National uh, Socialist Student Organizations were the biggest group inside elected student governments. And they were the people uh, organizing the book burnings. But was the university opposed to it? The university, again, couldn't, didn't feel it could be completely opposed to it because it was representing the popular will. After all, the National Socialists had just been elected in a landslide election, um, mainly because I'll they controlled you. it. You know. I'll bet you, even though they were anti-Semitic mobs and they were burning books, they went to class. <laughs> um, mm, well, they were German, but, uh, That's right. you know, but uh, no, it's not so. It's not so simple. I mean, yeah, there's, like, we could this go on a whole digression. Of kids taking over the school to me is like the inmates no, in charge of the asylum. The I, inmates, I don't understand the concept. The inmates can take over the asylum when they're on the same page as the wardens. So how did that happen? I mean, didn't we have real university presidents who were believed in a university education, or did they did they all go crazy first? So first of all, you're looking at the end point of a decades long process here. Uh, what people you know today are calling wokeism, and in the recent past we call being politically correct, and before that we called it being mindless leftists, has been a ongoing process until it has become the, the orthodoxy, if I can use that word, of university academics, at least in the, you know, the, the social science departments and the, uh, and the softer de departments. I mean, the students started demanding curriculum changes. Now, how, how if you're a student, do you tell the teacher, this is what you're going to teach me? You're supposed to be a student. So how do you have a right to dictate that? So first of all, I mean, in very many instances, they've taken their cue from academics who've told them this is what they ought to be doing. And so don't expect the academics and the administration to stand up against what they themselves are espousing. Secondly, um, they want a quiet life. You know, they, they just want this to go away. And it looks really bad in the fundraising videos to have, you know, policemen who look like they're in Alabama in 1966 rampaging around your campus cracking heads, which is the alternative. The alternative to having anarchy and Jews being beaten up is the police coming in and using their monopoly of legitimate force in a democratic country. But you don't have to. You could just go around and say to every student, you have an hour to get out of here or you're expelled from the university. Yeah, that would and then you wouldn't need the police. You, Just go what? around and every single person say, okay, here is your letter. We've written down your name. If you're here in an hour, then you are expelled from our university. And don't pack your bags and go. And that's a lot of money to lose. So that's what it is? It's partially. It's partially a lack of backbone. It's partially that the uh, administration and the academics ha not, haven't bought into the same viewpoint that the students have. They're marketing the same viewpoint that the students have. Um, and it's, yeah, it's hard to buck the, you know, the common wisdom, what everyone believes. Um, it's interesting. Victor Davis Hanson said, he's a professor, uh, that he says his contacts in the business world say that they are hesitant to hire graduates from Harvard and Columbia, and they would rather take them from, you know, more traditional universities because they feel like they're getting more of an education. Uh, so the students, if they ever realize this, are going to realize it too late. I really? mean, they've been sold a bill of goods. They're the ones who are going to suffer from it. I mean, a couple of, you know, more than 10 years ago, there was a terrible situation at Concordia University in Montreal, where it was a preview of what's happening now. Jewish students barred from campus. Jewish students had to be escorted off campus by the police for their own protection. Um, a long, ongoing program. Um, and when the Jewish students tried to organize against this, they found like that their biggest allies were 
the students taking real academic subjects, technology students, science students, all the Asian students, right, who just, you know, their, their, their idea of like running wild was to go to the chess club, you know, and they, <laughs> and, and they were all concerned about their future employment um, uh, prospects. And uh, if I were advising um, students on campus today, that is one of the things that I would be, I would be very much uh, to urging them to do, to build coalitions with other people on campus who don't want this, who see that it's bad for them. Uh, because might makes right. If the only voice on campus is the anti-Jewish voice, then reluctantly or not, the authorities will listen to it. So how can we... How do we have the ability to oppose this? Especially when you take into account that most of them have no idea. There was uh, somebody who went around interviewing them and says, the river to the sea, which river, which sea? They didn't know. People don't even know what the issues are. They've just right. taken to the street. They put on their kfia that they bought on Amazon and they and they just you know, spout the, the most horrible things, which if they did this against gays or against blacks, it would be a national, uh, you know, uh, scandal. But they're all spouting anti-Semitism and nobody cares. Well, as one administration figure put it, it depends on context. Right. right. If the context is against Jews, then people don't care. Why? It's not, it's not your grandfather's anti-Semitism. Uh, the thing about anti-Semitism, it's, it's a mutating virus. It manifests itself different ways and different periods in history. So in the, uh, you know, in, in the 1930s, uh, the Jews were uh, controlling finance and they're controlling the media. And the, oh, actually, they're all saying the same thing today. <laughs> but, uh, but, they, but now the issue is Jews are white and have white privilege, uh, again, something interesting that comes up in my Yad Vashem work when I'm guiding non-Jewish American groups around Yad Vashem. There's an exhibit there on, on uh, Nazi racism. Um, and the, there's a famous Nazi propaganda publication called the Untermensch, the subhuman. And I asked them, like, who's the poster boy? Who's the guy on the cover of it? And no, none of them know. I mean, this is the, the uh, exemplar of subhumanity. Is a Russian, because in the Nazi anti-Semitic racist worldview, you know, you had Aryans and you had other you know, white people who were okay, like Brits and French and Italians, and then then you became then it was subhumans, and the first, you know, subhumans were uh, Slavs, and Americans in general I mean, for, for quite reasonable historical reasons tend to see race exclusively in terms of skin color, unaware that there are other paradigms of race and other well, that systems was of race. Right. Right. When she says, you know, well, Hitler wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, racist. Right. <laughs> right. It was man's inhumanity to man, right? right. Except that they didn't think we were men. Uh, but, uh, it, it, you know, it, that's what you've got. I mean, the fact that Americans have a, have a very parochial view of what racism has been in history, you know, that's just a reality we have to deal with. Um, the, it, it's a larger issue of education. And you can talk about things like, you know, the, the persecution of the Roma and, uh, and the Sinti people, the gypsies. Uh, to try and open people's eyes to there being a wider context of racism. But the way things are set up today, Jews are white, white is bad, white is privilege. Uh, if you are brown skinned, then you are inherently more believable, more credible, more worthy of sympathy. And the fact that the majority of the population, the Jewish population of Israel, is of darker complexion is simply lost on yeah, everybody that's amazing, in isn't it? Yeah, because they're not dealing with the reality of the situation here. That was they, the story you told about this Arab person who says, I can't be anti Semitic, I'm a Semite. Right. And you had a brilliant response, which I've never been able to say over. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I said I'm very, very grateful to you for uh, pointing out to us that you are not anti-Semitic. The, the, the term anti-Semitism invent, was invented by a 19th century German Jew hater called Wilhelm Marr, 
who didn't like the term Jew hatred because it didn't sound anti it didn't sound sufficiently scientific. So he invented this term anti-Semitism. Um, but it has nothing to do with Semitic peoples or Semitic languages. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of the most virulent anti-Semitism in the world today comes from people who are technically and uh, Semitic themselves. But I'm very glad for you. Yeah, you know, very glad you told us you couldn't possibly be anti-Semitic because otherwise, given all the terrible things you said about Jews, we might have made the th the mistake of thinking that you actually were anti-Semitic. So thank you for the clarification. And it went right over this guy's head. No, but head. then he had this, this phrase that he used. He says, so to refer to it as other Semitic people is anti and, oh, yeah, right. It's you're being anti-semantic, right? <laughs> anti-semantic, <laughs> right? If you look up the meaning of anti-Semitism in the in the dictionary, it means hatred of Jews. That's nothing with Jewish, uh, with uh, Semitic language or Semitic races. So I accuse you of being anti-Semantic. Right. And uh, you know, again, That's a great line. <laughs> it's not original to me. Right? I think uh, I stole it from Samuel Goldwyn. But uh, it, uh, the interesting thing is, I was doing this on a university campus in Britain. Uh, and again, the, the situation in Britain was worse than it was in America. I got a huge laugh from the average student in the audience who are open to hearing a different viewpoint. They're not all sold on this, you know, we'll use a contemporary term, woke uh, viewpoint. Right. But today, if you were to go onto a campus and try to counter these arguments, you'd be shouted down. Mm-hmm. They'd protest. They would. They would. Dis they wouldn't allow you to speak. In England, they let you speak at least. Uh, yeah. Why? Because in that particular instance, for example, I was uh, in contact with the campus administration in advance, and arranged to have security laid on. Um, had a. I was in a debate uh, in Toronto once. Same thing. I arranged with um, the you know, my, myself and the students who were bringing me in. Uh, we arranged with the campus administration that they should have extra security. And Mounties. The, uh, no, no, it was. Uh, it was um, <laughs> I just find the kinds of the community with, with the hats. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, no, but it was uniformed police in the hall, and there was one guy on the front row who I thought he was trying to intimidate me. It was really like gazing at me very intently at everything that I said. And uh, I'm not going to be intimidated. So it finishes up and, uh, you know, people come up and want to speak to you. And this guy comes up to me. Interestingly, I had an English accent. Uh, and he comes up to me and says, I'd like to shake your hand. <laughs> I said, oh, did, did, you, did you like what I had to say? He says, very much, very much. I said, so what brought you here? He says, oh, I'm an undercover police officer. I'm here to protect you. <laughs> <laughs> So you know, you can't always tell. Who you're right. You can't. Certainly, you know, this guy, you couldn't. He fitted I, in very well. I look at these videos of of conservative speakers on campus, and you know what they're subjected to. You know, is just it's just unbelievable. I don't know how they get through it. Look, you know, uh, La Habdil, I don't want to compare, but we in Israel have a certain uh, problem that we face of people who don't like us. Uh, Amazing, eh? uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, especially you, you're so likable. I don't they're, know why. they're also not willing to listen. They're also not willing to listen. So what do we do? I saw Amnon Yitzchak once in Hebrew University. Yeah, and these people just came in the room and just kept shouting and shouting. The other students were like, "Just, just leave. We want to hear what he has to say," you know. And they wouldn't stop. And he just sat there. He put out the video of it. He was just sitting there, smiling, waiting, you know, to speak. And they would not allow him to speak. It went on for like an hour. So. I, I wasn't even talking about people like that. I'm talking like, you know, guys with Kalashnikov rifles and missiles. Oh, the ones trying to kill us? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So, you know... There's definitely we, one way of making a point. Yes. So, so at least it shows your commitment. Um, so, you know, our, our response to that is not to say, oh, you know, please just, you know, leave us alone. We have to take appropriate measures to deal with the threat that we face. And I'm, I, I tell students uh, around the world that you, know, you don't have to be pushovers. You have to be willing to take whatever measures are legally uh, legitimate to protect your right to speak. And don't expect other people to do it for you. 
You're going to yeah, but at this point, I feel like Aragon at the gates of Mordor, and a gazillion orcs are coming out. How, how there's no way to if they don't destroy the ring, they're all going to die. That's obvious. So over here, you go into campus, and it, you're facing this kind of a mob, and no one's going to listen to you, and no one's going to let you speak. Where do you get where do you get your message in there? How do you get it in? So you are clever and that you're able to present the ideas, but the presentation of ideas only work if people are willing to listen. And that's why what I find amazing is Joe Biden is being heckled by the pro-Palestinian people and going genocide Joe, etc. Trump doesn't have that. Right. Trump just had a rally with like tens of thousands of people in New Jersey. Nobody was heckling him. Right. You know. Um, there's a, there are reasons that I understand the mechanism of how Trump organizes his rallies. But to return to your- Biden s- needs those people because otherwise there'd be nobody there. <laughs> so to return to your uh, analogy from the Lord of the Rings, you can tell Aragon wasn't Jewish. <laughs> because if he had been Jewish, you know, all those you know, hordes of orcs would have come out and Aragon would have raised his hand dramatically and a little guy with a briefcase would come out and say, I'm a lawyer and I've got a writ. <laughs> you know? uh, so what, uh, Jews are uh, striking back. They are bringing legal cases against university administrations because you have to make the university administrations pay a, pay a price for giving in to the anti-Semites. So university administrations are... You know, they're giving in to these anti-Semites for a variety of reasons we've discussed, but one of them is because it's a path of least resistance. Right. We have to be willing to make it something that it's easier to resist because the, the penalty for giving to, in to these people is, is going to be costing the university big bucks. But it's, now, but it's now, a joke not, when you see that when anybody uh, – you know, Donald Trump says anything, he's accused of being an anti-Semite. There's no yeah, accused of being an anti-Semite. And here you see the whole left wing spouting the most basic anti-Semitic stuff and no one's saying anything. Well, well a lot of- the outrage all of a sudden? We're, we're everyone calling people anti-Semites. And they'll still turn around to the right and say, oh, the white supremacists are anti-Semitic. Or if you criticize- uh, What's his name? The the guy who funds all the uh, Soros. Soros, you're an anti-Semite. So you know, I, I, people used to ask me you know, if uh, if I felt comfortable bringing up a family here in uh, in uh, in Israel, and I said, you know, yeah, if there isn't another Middle East that I can go to, this is the reality they were facing. It that you have to realize that is the reality you're facing in North America, and fetching about it isn't going to change it. So what do you do? So I mean, I'm saying, I understand you can go after the universities, but everybody in the street, I, for the life of me, I could not understand this concept of ripping down the pictures of the hostages when they were doing that. What was your point? Okay. They're not hostages. We made it up. You don't care about the little children and the elderly who were stolen. Like, what's your point? And you see these videos of people who are doing it and they can't even explain it themselves. It's like this, this... This base anti-Semitism that, that, that doesn't make any sense. Why rip down a picture of a hostage? Because two reasons. One, they understand that it actually does elicit sympathy for Israel and Jews. So people will rip them down. For that. That's enough reason to do it. We don't want anybody uh, successfully eliciting sympathy for Jews in Israel. And the other reason, which I think for most of the people doing this is more important, is that politics is tribal. My tribe doesn't like this. Now, okay, I'm not so high up on the totem pole. I know everything that the tribe is supposed to know, but I know my tribe's against this, so I'm against it. And uh, you know, tribal politics isn't limited to the left. It applies to the right as well. But the people that we need to convince are not part of the tribes. The people we need to convince are the people in the middle who are just looking on and saying, these guys are crazy. The people we need to convince are the ones who, for example, are the university students who are going to be tarred with the brush of, you went to a crazy school. The people we need to convince are- well, It's going the, to take years till they face It took years to get here. It took yeah. decades to get here. 
So, you know, that's I mean, the reason. If they were doing this against blacks or against uh, gay, this would be the biggest outrage in society. And you're allowed to attack, attack blacks. And that's what they said to these university presidents who testified in Congress. This is what if it was again? What if you transgendered somebody? You fired someone for trans mis mis misgendered. Mis right. So you 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 fired them, and, and here people are going for genocide, and you say it's got to be in context. So it's like this 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 anti anti semitism is in. It's cool, and and it's hard to bucket when it's when it's not. It's not even a problem. You call somebody an anti semite, like well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, duh. <laughs> so, what do you want me to tell you? The world's not fair, right? But I don't see how we're supposed to undo this. So you you undo it. You That's undo. Right. When I when I was watching you, uh, where you were able to engage, you engage in a battle of ideas. You engaged in where you were able to bring across the other message. Today, except for Douglas Murray, who single handedly is trying to fight the gazillion Palestinian spokespeople, you know. And Finkelstein and these other characters, you know, how do you how do you stand up to all of them? So, you, the practical answer is you don't undo a process of decades in a couple of sound bites. So that's it. So right now we just got to be patient. Uh, we don't just have to be patient, but we do have to be patient. There's, there are things we can do right now, and I'll, I'll talk about them in a second, but. A solution to this isn't going to come about overnight. We have ignored it mm. for decades, and now we're paying the price for it. Um, the time to have got people fired for having anti-Semitic views on campus was 35 years ago. Um, and yeah, if we didn't do it then, then we're paying the price for it now. Okay, let's start now. Well, the people suggest it's the f they're getting funding from the from the Arabs. Uh, countries that is fueling this. Uh... Right. Absolutely. I mean, Qatar isn't just a problem you have when uh, you have a cold. Uh, Qatar is uh, a major funder of, uh, of education in North America, uh, as is China, for example. So, you know, I think there's China a- China is anti-Israel? No, no. But it is theoretically a potential rival, let's put it this way, to the United States. And it's, it's, uh, it's injecting a lot of money and a lot of views into American education. And there is a constituency out there that can understand that that is not in America's interest. And whereas they might not be particularly concerned about Jews, they might be concerned, and it might be relatively easy to make them concerned, about foreign funding of American academic institutions. And once you've raised that, you're not talking about Qatar, you're, talk you're not talking about Iran, you're talking about any foreign funding. So, you know, look, I, I talked about how bad it was more than 40 years ago, British University. Campus. How is it now in England? Uh, it's not as bad as it is in the US. <laughs> Amazing. Right? And, and there's I, more Arabs in... in there's more Muslims in They used to call it London stand. You're right, you know? right. Uh, I'll tell you why it's not because of the work that we did 40 years ago. Now, we had things a little bit easier for us in the UK because being Brits, everything is very centralized. There is one Jewish student organization for the entire country. There is one student organization for the entire country. And it happened to be at that time that the Jewish student organization and the National Union of Students their offices were literally next door to each other. One was at one to two Ensley Street, the other was at three to four Ensley Street. And we had very good relations with the people who ran the National Union of Students. And because we lobbied people on a high level, you know, in that context it was high level, uh, and, and we got them on our side, that was, we were able to structurally change the setup. Uh, so that um, they introduced rules saying that if you banned a Jewish student club from your campus, they would kick you out of the National Union of Students. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that same kind of centralization it's so in the US. You this because I was being interviewed for a job to, I was being pressured to take a job in England to start a youth organization. And they said, but we're going to have to work around the existing 
organization because there's already a major Jewish organization. I don't want to mention any names. Major organization and it has a youth organization and it's not efficient and people are wasting money and they don't have the funds. So we have to work around them. <laughs> so being an American, I said, so why don't you just like, you know, break down the doors and, and fire them all. And like, you could see around the room, there was like this audible gasp. And finally one person said, this is England. We don't break down the doors <laughs> of a 150-year-old institution and throw the rascals out. <laughs> we have respect for tradition. I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> I'm an American. Burn it to the ground and start over. <laughs> right. And so that's it. That's, so that worked to your advantage. We don't have that in America. Right, you don't have that in America. But you have other things that work for your advantage. Like, you know, lawsuits. The, uh, you know, people are bringing in lawsuits against some uh, academic institutions today to make them pay for uh, discriminating against Jewish students. Oh, we're not discriminating. Yeah, well, we'll see you in court. Right. And guess who has better lawyers, you know? <laughs> Jackie Mason says, every Jew wakes up in the morning and says, who can I sue? Right. <laughs> I be able to sue somebody. But you mentioned one thing I wanted to go back to before you... you suggest solutions. And that is, you mentioned how it's not just on the left, it's on the right. Now, the Republican Party over the years has always been very pro-Israel, more so than the Democrats, which has been soft and now is moving more and more towards the Arab cause. But uh, I mean, there are those who would suggest that Donald Trump was not only the best American president for Israel, he was the best Israeli prime minister for Israel. <laughs> so he was so he was more pro-Israel than Israel. He was he, they, he was moving ahead of them. He recognized Gaza. He moved the this and you know and it was uh, it was amazing. Um, but uh, now there are voices on the right. I'm thinking Tucker Carlson. I'm thinking. Um, uh, what's her name? The, uh, the, the, the Candace Owens. I'm thinking, um, uh, um, this Patrick Ben David, you know, certain other voice on the right who are becoming somewhere between ambivalent to hostile towards Israel. How, where's that coming from? Why are you surprised? I'm I mean surprised because for years they used to be the ones who spoke up the loudest in defense of Israel as opposed to the Democrats who were wishy-washy at best. Well, look, I don't want to argue about who's older here, but we've both got a few white hairs. <laughs> I can remember when the political right in America was hugely influenced by Arab oil money. Right. Right. But that goes back to the 50s and 60s. I don't think in the 70s and 80s. You know what? Times change. Yeah. And one thing we as Jews should realize is we have no permanent friends. Mm. Whoever it is who's supporting us this year can turn against us next year. I feel like it was Lord Asquith, but you would probably know better, who said, England has neither allies nor enemies, only national interests. Right, right. I think it's, it was Lord Asquith. It's, I think it might have been Lao Tzu, but it's, it's, it's a popular phrase. He wouldn't have said it about England. Yeah, right. it's, uh, it's, it's a truism. And, it, and Jews don't have friends, with exceptions. I mean, you know, again, wearing my Yad Vashem hat, there are 28,000 people who risk their lives to save Jews that we know of during, during the Holocaust. Well, what's so interesting is that through all of this, Germany has been very supportive of Israel. And right. just now they said that they will honor the ICC's request to arrest Netanyahu if he comes. Right. So Which seems to... like a real serious change. No, you have to understand that they signed off on uh, on on the treaty that credit the ICC. They're required by the treaty obligation to arrest anybody the ICC gives uh, an arrest warrant on. Uh, the US and Israel are not signatories and therefore, you know, the U.S. doesn't have to. But yeah, you know, that means that the uh, the Germany has to arrest Putin if he comes to uh, to Germany. You know, they might not put a huge amount of effort into it, and they probably won't put too much effort into arresting Netanyahu either. But they're required legally by their treaty obligations to do it, which is why the whole thing was such a hop. By the, I, I listened a couple of days ago. 
um, to the BBC, you know, and I'm, I'm, I, I feel I haven't. You're a real glutton for punishment. <laughs> well, I haven't quite got my daily dose of anti Semitism. I listened to the BBC and they interviewed a lawyer who's involved in the International Court of Justice case, not the ICC case, the International Court of Justice case against Israel, about the ICC case. And uh, it was astonishing what the guy said because this guy is not pro Israel. He says, well, look, um, the prosecutor in the National Court, in the International uh, Criminal Court, uh, could not just go after Hamas because then he'd be criticized for not being even handed. Uh, so we had the option of either going after nobody or going after both. So he quite w wisely chose to go after both. And this is a guy, he's a legal commentator, uh, he's a top-notch international lawyer, and he's saying, yeah, don't worry, it's not really about the law, it's about politics. Wow. Uh, but it, if the ICC goes ahead and issues their arrest warrants, that means that countries around the world are legally obligated to arrest Israeli leaders if they come there. Now, don't worry, you know, if the Hamas leadership goes there, they'll get arrested as well. But, you know, they're, they're trying, they're, they're, their frequent filing mileage isn't quite as good as our leaders because they can't go anywhere because they'll be killed. So, you know, I'm telling you, it, it's not a fair world. Jews have been living with anti-Semitism for millennia. But I can't remember anything like this in my lifetime. Well, at our age, our memory starts to fail us. I'm just saying, when I was growing up, yeah, when I was growing up in the 60s, did I have uh, people who would throw pennies at me? Yeah. You know, yeah, but that was usually during a lecture, and I collected them at the end. But, <laughs> you know, but I've had anti-Semitic comments or things like that, but this kind of mobs walking through the street of Sydney chanting, gas the Jews. Right. Did I ever think I would see something like that in my lifetime? Well, you know, we have seen it in our lifetimes. We've seen it on the political fringes. Right. But now it's mainstream. So is it mainstream? It's certainly more mainstream than it was when it was the American Nazi Party screaming it. But I, I still maintain there is a vast body of opinion out there that is not against us. It is the silent major majority, right. as people say. And our job- How do we, how do we energize them? And we have to energize them all by right, so first I've of been, all addressing them. By first of all addressing them. I've been, adre I've been inter interrupting the whole time, which is one of the comments I get when I have a guest. <laughs> they say, why don't you let anybody else talk? And I say, you know, that reminds me of a story. But anyway, <laughs> so you, you, you said there are some solutions and- I, I, this is what I'm. This is what I find intriguing because it's. I'm looking at at blackness, and I don't see any way out of this. Can you say that? <laughs> um, so, oh, uh, couple, I'm, see, I'm, I'm, so, I'm at the uh, gates of Mordor. That's right. what I'm saying. I see a gazillion orcs coming out, and I don't see what I'm supposed to do. Okay, so there's your I answer. I can take down a troll here and there, but that's about the best the, I can do. The people who fought the trolls of Mordor were leading a grand coalition. They got together all the various people who had an interest in helping them. And that's what we have to do. We have to put together the Fellowship of the Ring uh, <laughs> and get people who have reasons to support us. Not just because they love Jews, because that's only enough for a tiny handful of people. But... I'll give you an example. BDS, right? Boycott, divestment, and sanctions. There are people braying today on university campuses. The, the university endowment should disinvest from Israel, sell all its investments in Israel. Well, you think Harvard, that used to have limits on how many Jews could go there. That's when their endowment uh, dates from. They put their money in investments in Israel because they love Israel. They put, them, they put it into uh, investments in Israel because their investment advisors told them there will be a good return. So if they are told by ideologues, sell your investments, they're being told to lose money. Okay, so what I've told students on campus is go to the janitorial staff, the, cl the lab assistants, all the people who don't have tenure on campus and say, look, these pampered, tenured professors want you to lose your jobs because when the university starts having less income, it's not going to be the tenured professors whose jobs are going to go. It's you. 
And if you're a left-wing academic or anti-Israel person on campus, then stand up against the labor unions on campus and see how stupid you look. On top of which, they're, an, they're another constituency that the university has to pay attention to because they don't want strikes. If you think, you know, um, students camping out and asking for uh, gluten-free food is disruptive of campuses, the janitorial staff going on strike is a much bigger deal. So you make coalitions with other student groups on campus. And I mentioned a couple, like the, uh, the serious students who are involved in, in serious subjects. Do you, want an, yeah, do you want to be employed after this? It's in your interest to get rid of these people. Um, off campus, you have to find people who you can make alliances with without convincing them. You don't need to convince them that we're right because that takes time and it takes effort and it takes a willingness to listen. You have to convince them that their needs and our needs overlap and we're willing to support them if they're willing to support us. That is the short-term solution to deal with these problems. The long-term solution is to win the argument. Now, interestingly enough, and I, th I think you must have seen a lot of this. Uh, you're the Kirov guy, I'm not, right? But uh, we used to say in the student organization in Britain, what we need is a good pogrom. Because you know, there is nothing that makes Jews come out of the woodwork and realize they're Jewish than anti-Semitism on campus. Now, we don't want people being beaten up and we don't want people being, you know, killed, but when Jews are confronted with the inescapable fact that they're Jews, we're Am Kashairif. There's a lot of uh, secular Jews who are having a period of reevaluation through this. I mean, I had a, my daughter works on NYU campus and she says, you know, the reaction of the Jewish students when they realize here they were good liberal students and all the liberal causes and now they're the ones who are being persecuted for just for the fact that they're Jewish forces them to reevaluate who they are. Right. They say the definition of a neoconservative is a liberal who's been mugged. Right. So uh, Jewish students all across North America and the Western world are being mugged every day. Right. And that's going to make a big difference in terms of I mean, of a number of these Jewish uh, donors pulled out of these universities. Right. Which is making a, a, a dent on them. Right. And they're going to feel it. But even, you know, the uh, limitless wealth of the Zionist lobby doesn't really match up to Qatar. Right. So I mentioned earlier that you can... So you have to pass a law that there's no foreign... Right. And, and you, can't, you can't get a law like that passed because it's good for the Jews. Right. right. You have to do it because it's good. It's, it's China good. is going to steal right. your... It's going to steal your technology. It's going to, it's going to indoctrinate your students to be pro-Chinese. I mean, good grief. You know, the, the, I, I saw a clip of a biopic about Bruce Lee hmm. made in contemporary China. And the whole uh, ethos of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the movie was, I am Chinese. You know, it's, 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 he, it's Chinese patriotism, it's Ch Chinese nationalism, which is in reality nothing that Bruce Lee was ever in the least interested in. It came from Hong he Kong. He was Kato. He worked with the Green Hornet. Yeah, he was Japanese at that point. <laughs> uh, but, he was good at it. He was, yeah, yeah. But you, you see well, he the, beat up Robin. Right, oh, uh, boy, did he. <laughs> Robin but you see, colonialism, it was forced into a subservient uh, role to a white man. That was, you know, uh, well, that's the thing, is that usually the sidekick is nowhere as good. But here, like Batman and the Green Hornet are these two like middle-aged guys sort of like punching each other. And Cato is just beating uh, Robin all around the room. It was just, it was sad to watch. Anyway, <laughs> and Burt Wood once said he didn't get a stunt double. So Bruce Lee actually just beat him up. <laughs> So you see, you do remember the distant past. <laughs> I mean, that was uh, important things like Batman. That I remember. But, uh, you know, I mean, I just remember, you know, there would be anti-Semitism, but it didn't have the social veneer that it has now. There was no TikTok and Facebook, which was glorified. Somebody said to me, and I don't know, but they said to me, you watch these clips from people like Douglas Murray or, 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 um, or Ben Shapiro or people like this. He says... There are thousands of sites with tens of millions of views that are all anti-Semitic that everybody's watching. 
And you how you think that your you know hundred thousand people who are watching uh, Douglas Murray has a chance against those tens of millions who are watching all this terrible anti-Semitism? So that is a very valid point, but not quite as valid as people think it is, because you're not watching those anti-Israel sites unless it's to do research. One of the problems about social media, and it, it, it existed before there was social media, is that we live in echo chambers. We watch things that we agree with. Correct. Right. And there are lots of people out there who, you know, surprise, surprise, don't like Jews who watch things they disagree that they agree with. What's everybody else watching apart from cat videos? Now, we need to find ways to reach the people who are not already committed to one camp or the other. Well, though they obviously have a certain sensitivity to our side if they're watching cats. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because if it's cats or it's Cohen or it's uh, Goldberg. <laughs> Look, I'll, I'll just give you one final point. The, you know, the, the late Robin Williams. Yeah. Uh, you believe what the Chazal say about some people, Kona Alam Haba Bashar Achad. He was uh, apparently once interviewed on uh, on uh, German television on a talk show. And they asked him, Mr. Williams, they say we Germans have a problem with humor. Do you think that's true? And if so, why? And Robin Williams said, it's because you killed all the funny people. (laughs) (laughs) I I think we have a secret (laughs) weapon. We're funny. And we can make fun of these guys. And they are dour and boring and uh, they're... uh, they think everything depends so, on context. Seinfeld was just speaking at a commencement address, and and he said, you know, people talk about privilege like it's a bad thing. Everybody has privileges. He says, I'm a Jew from New York. That's an advantage if you want to be a comedian. Because <laughs> 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 you leg up on other people, you know. But, uh, okay, so as we conclude, a simple person like me and the tens of thousands of people who watch this show what can we, Lemaisa, do at this point besides try to stay safe? Um, I wouldn't necessarily talk so much about trying to stay safe. On the contrary. So we should go out there and confront these mobs? No. You should make, you should take every opportunity you can without being a bore to mention something about Jews and Israel in the current situation. You know, I was uh, I, I went to Britain uh, in October. I went for my nephew's Kastner. And I'm coming out of a train station in Leeds. I'm waiting for my Uber. A lot of Arabs in Leeds. Uh, Muslims, not Arabs. The, uh, and uh, this obviously non-Jewish guy who was bigger than me walks up and he says, can I tell you something? I said, yeah, whatever you want. You know? <laughs> and he says, Every right-thinking person in this country is behind you and your people. <laughs> and I, I shook the guy's hand. I said, thank you. And I, thank you for telling me that. But I want to ask you to do something. Tell other people that as well. We can die from silence. Yeah. And if we aren't telling at least one person a day that it's not just bad for us, it's bad for them, right. then we are complicit in our own demise. So we have to tell them, listen, you know, if if they come after the Jews, you won't have any lawyers, you won't have any accountants, you won't have any doctors, and there'll be no wholesale. <laughs> so ask yourself if that's worth it, your own personal benefit. Uh, to the heart of the matter, as usual, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> I just noticed that was the second time you were confronted by a scary-looking person who actually was in, uh, on your side. I've got a very long list. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, unfortunately, uh, we're out of time for now. And uh, there's so much more to talk about. And we'll have to have you back here on the Rabbi Olansky Show. But for now, uh, if you want to find out more about the uh, show, you can go to my website, RabbiOlansky.com. You can make a comment. You can watch any of the other material there or read any of the material that's there. You can sign up for one of our online shiurim. And uh, you can sponsor an episode, sponsor a question and answer. And so until next time, I am David Olavsky. I am David Oleska. Don't get us confused. And that, I have to say that. That's the, 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 
most important point is how often you and I get phone calls for the other person because he's David Oleska on Rehovagasi and I'm David Orlovsky on Rehovagasi. And, uh, the first you know, time we ever met, it was because we'd been double booked at the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> And so we are we are the David O's, and, and uh, next time this has been the Rabbi Olowski Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Torah and Simcha ready to go. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Knowledge and wisdom will help you grow. Lots of fun in every episode, and we don't have to rhyme. No, we don't. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show on RabbiOrlovsky.com. Torah, anytime, YouTube, and more. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Torah and Simba, ready to go. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Till next time, till we meet again. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show.